The purpose of Free Thought Forum is to be vigilant to the encroachment of religion into government and to educate the general public as to what a free thinker is. My thoughts give me power. No scholar can map them. No hunter can trap them. No person can deny. No person can deny. Good afternoon. Welcome to Free Thought Forum. It's a pleasure to be with you today. We'd like to welcome you to this opportunity to step outside your normal boundaries of thought. We'd like to challenge you to go beyond some of the ideas that you may have picked up culturally, some of the dogma that you may have been taught, some of the ideas that you've absorbed either through your family, through your religious training, or through your culture in general. Free Thought Forum is about bringing ideas forward, considering them, going beyond the typical beliefs that you uh, encounter in your upbringing, and beginning to expand your mind and, as a matter of fact, think freely. We'd like to invite you to be a free thinker and challenge you to step outside those boundaries. One of the things that is particularly characteristic of free thinkers is denial of the supernatural. In general, you will find that free thinkers say that there's not anything that happens by magic nothing that happens beyond what we can reasonably attempt to investigate or understand through normal, what we would call, natural processes. So part of being a free thinker uh, can imply that you go outside of and that you actually go against the tide, go against the grain of how people typically think in our culture. I'd like to first thank uh, Catherine Farringer for making this program possible. She's worked for many years and uh, uh, given many people opportunity to express their ideas on this forum. So we owe a special debt of gratitude to her. I want to thank, thank our camera people, Albert and, uh, uh, and Jan King. Bert and Jan come in and uh, uh, do this work for us regularly. And they're some of the soldiers in the trenches that you don't see. We want to thank them for helping us make this, get this program on the air. Uh, today I'm going to talk about what I think could be a, an especially controversial subject, but something that uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about lately, and uh, an idea that I think uh, perhaps if you will follow along with me, will make you uh, step back and look a second time at some of the ideas that are very common in our culture. What I'm going to do, and again this is typical of free thinkers, is I'm going to go beyond just telling you what I think on the subject. I'm going to do what Carl Sagan, I'm sure you know Carl Sagan as a famous uh, astronomer and free thought spokesman, Carl Sagan would ask to present the evidence. He would ask you to present uh, a source for your facts. So one of the things I'm going to do today is show you some sources for some of the ideas that I'm talking about and ask you, challenge you, to go back to some of these sources and follow back to some of the sources that they cite and in this way expand your thinking on these ideas rather than simply accepting what I say or someone who holds up only one set of supposedly holy or special writings and denies you the opportunity to go back and investigate uh, further on the subject for yourself. Uh, the point being I'm going to mention several and show you several books about the ideas that I'm uh, talking about here. So the first book that I'm going to talk about um, is from a person that I've, uh, I've referred to many times. Uh, this is a book by Joseph Campbell, 
and it's considered one of his classic works. It's called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And why I think this book is especially important, Joseph Campbell makes the point in this book that uh, many of the religious and mythic ideas that are talked about and that, are, uh, that you encounter around the world are in fact the same set of ideas. That is, that it talks about essentially the same hero dressed in many different costumes. He refers to these social settings or these social frameworks for this hero. He refers the, to them as a mask. What he says essentially is that we as individuals are taught from the earliest age up to wear a mask and that there are people who wear this mask without even thinking. They put the mask on because their parents tell them to put that mask on. In essence, the parents put the mask onto the child and the child wears the mask for their entire lifetime without ever questioning it. Uh, Joseph Campbell suggests that there are a few people in this society who will challenge their cultural beliefs. They will go outside the boundaries looking for solutions uh, to life's major problems. And these are the people who become the hero in a culture. And what he says is that um, these heroes, these people who step outside the boundaries of their culture, um, that this hero wears a different mask and that in each culture the hero wears a different mask but it's all the same hero. So he calls this the hero with a thousand masks or with a thousand faces. He, he equates a face and a mask. So he talks about a hero with a thousand faces. This is one of the, uh, the one of the essential and original works of uh, Joseph Campbell. So I'm going to lead from this into uh, what cultures teach people and where it is that these heroes originate and how the beliefs about heroes and cultures are carried forward through history. So one of our first books was Joseph Campbell and the Hero with a Thousand Faces. A second book that I want to talk about today is one uh, by a gentleman by the name of Edward Carpenter. And this book, um, The Origins of Pagan and Christian Beliefs, uh, The Origin of Christian and Pagan Beliefs, I think uh, will give you an opportunity to look back and see that although claims are made by Christianity, and other religious beliefs that theirs is the original source, that all of these beliefs began with them. As a matter of fact, that is not true. Those beliefs did not begin with them. Those beliefs were passed down uh, with human beings from generation to generation for literally tens of thousands of years. So it's not the case at all that the writings in the Bible originated uh, with either the early Christians or with the Jewish authors to whom uh, they're attributed. These beliefs, these writings, these ideas that are expressed in, for instance, the Old Testament were around for thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of years before they were ever recorded in the Bible. Similarly, the claim is made uh, in Islam, the Muslim holy book is the Quran, and the typical um, Muslim will make the claim that um, one of the angels, the angel Gabriel, came to Muhammad and spoke to Muhammad and told Muhammad to write, and that Muhammad got all of these writings from an angel of God, and that's how the book of, uh, how the Quran came into existence. 
As a matter of fact, the Quran is the writings of a much older group called the Quraysh, the Quraysh tribe, of which Muhammad was a member. And so Muhammad had memorized many of these sayings. Uh, many of the things that are in the Quran were simply the oral traditions of his tribe. And Muhammad happened to be one of the first who caused these writings to be written down. Now I would say that it's typical of uh, claims about holy books that the people in these books are in fact real characters. If you consider, for instance, uh, some of the stories that we here in Texas hear about the wild, wild west or about people here in Texas, even though there may have been a real person at one time who lived these events, um, it's not always true that the particular events described were lived by that particular person. As a matter of fact, it's very common on television and in the movies to make up some mythical character and attribute to that mythical character the kinds of experiences that perhaps were quite common during the period that that supposed person lived. So we have characters like Roy Rogers or Gene Autry or uh, uh, Pecos Bill. Uh, Pecos Bill, if you read uh, some of the uh, Texas tall tales, takes some typical cowboy experiences and expands them beyond all belief. Now that's very typical of oral traditions, of stories that are told by people, is that they take typical experiences and expand on them and embellish on them, and eventually these embellished stories get recorded. Of course, what often happens is that uh, the embellished stories don't get attributed to their real sources. And many of them, as a, many of the sources, as a matter of fact, many of the stories have no real source. They started somewhere in some very distant time past and were passed literally uh, from math, mouth to mouth uh, over generations from, from mouth to ear and then retold and retold. And so it's really the, the origins of these stories are lost in, uh, in human history. And that's exactly what happened both with the Bible and with the Quran. But as I mentioned earlier, many of these stories, even though embellished and told in special ways, biased, to favor the person who's told the story, many of these stories have some basis in fact. There are many books that trace the origins of these stories and who tell, uh, many of these books tell how these stories were passed from one civiliz civilization to another civilization. And there's another book by Joseph Campbell that both links together these stories that are passed from civilization to civilization and uh, describes how these stories came to be a part of our culture. One of those books is The Mythic Image. The Mythic Image by Joseph Campbell uh, describes how some of the, the images and some of the stories that are popular among uh, Westerners today, where these images came from and how they got passed from civilization to civilization. For instance, one of the popular images that we talk about that people hear about is something called the evil eye. Few people know that the evil eye uh, was first recorded thousands of years ago in Egyptian mythology. And that, as a matter of fact, the left eye 
uh, the left eye and the whole left side of the body uh, is characterized as the evil eye. And so this evil eye, this eye with the special powers, uh, was the eye that was destroyed when uh, one of the famous myth mythical characters, you probably heard of Isis and, uh, and Horus and Osiris, when these three famous characters uh, were in a life and death struggle, um, the son uh, battled against an evil character and he sacrificed his eye in order to save the bat, in order to win the battle. Uh, that was the price that he had to pay. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, even to this day, uh, the left eye is still considered especially powerful. Uh, that, that whole thing about this powerful eye was passed through Asia, through the South Pacific, where at the time of Captain Cook, uh, there, were, there were sacrifices, there were feasts at which uh, Captain Cook was specifically offered the left eye from uh, a sacrificial victim. And to this day in the Mideast, when a goat is killed for a feast, the eye is taken out and offered to the honored guest as a special symbol of power. So the point of all of that is that there are symbols of religion and power that are passed from generation to generation and from civilization to civilization that we are not aware of and further that if we're part of a religious tradition that the people in that religious tradition don't explain to us where these originated or how they got passed down to us. Now, a book that I have found just astonishingly useful in this regard is a book by Barbara G. Walter. Now, this book is called The Women's Encyclopedia, um, The Women's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets. And this book is very much like the Encyclopedia Britannica in the, in the regard that it takes individual subjects and just gives a short explanation of that particular item, where it came from, and it's very pow this book uh, is not shy at all about dispelling ideas about where this concept came from and, uh, and how that concept has been built into our present day culture. Well, I've taken quite a bit of time to come around today to today's subject, that is blood and sin and blood and human sacrifice in Jewish and Christian history. And the reason for me taking this amount of time is to make clear to you that what I'm saying is not something that I've just sort of thought of and it seems like a great idea for me to talk to you about, but that in fact you can go to each one of these books which have extensive bibliographies and follow, trace back that these ideas are firmly founded in archaeological findings, anthropology, and the research of human culture. It's not just something uh, that's limited to, to me or anyone else telling you these ideas as a matter of authority, that it, they are things that you can discover for yourself and that you can research for yourself and, uh, and understand how they all fit together. So the idea of sin somehow causes humans, and we don't know where this comes from, but humans have the idea that when things go wrong in the world, there must be something wrong with them as an individual. And many religious systems tell you this. They tell you that you personally have something wrong with you. As a matter of fact, you don't have anything wrong with you. You are a good and positive person. You are here like every other living being because you're part of the universe. 
there's nothing wrong with you spiritually, mentally, or psychologically necessarily. There are people who are born with chemical deficiencies that cause their brain to be imperfect. There are people who are subjected to traumatic experiences and it causes them to behave in unusual and erratic fashion. But in general, looking at a bell curve, the large majority of, of human beings are normal, positive, energetic, good people. So this idea of sin is in itself an aberration. This idea of sin is in itself perverse. This idea of sin is something that causes people to feel guilty about themselves and to feel that they have to do something to make up for, to somehow compensate for what they are told is wrong with them. It's all hogwash. There is nothing wrong with you. But added on top of this idea of sin is something that even further twists and perverts the human character and causes us as individuals uh, to begin to behave in ways that it, it's difficult to imagine. Uh, the, the, I search for a word that could encompass the, uh, the, the misery and the tragedy that these ideas have brought on human beings. And the idea associated with sin is that there must be a sacrifice that, as a matter of fact, even more horrible than a sacrifice is that blood must be shed to make up for this mythical idea of sin in human beings. Now, these two ideas are strongly embodied in the Christian writings. If you go to the Bible, the Bible will tell you. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Of course, that is in itself a sick idea. But beyond that sick idea, heaped on top of it and compounded, is the idea that you must shed blood in order to make up for this supposed sin. As a matter of fact, any Christian can quote the Bible verse for you that says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Let me repeat that. They say, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. I present to you that that is a sick and perverse idea, that there is something wrong with humans that requires either human blood or animal blood to be shed in order to make up for this, this supposed wrong. And because of this idea, all kinds of psychological distortions, all kinds of psychological sickness happens to human beings. I mean, one of the most primitive concepts, one of the most primitive experiences that human beings can have is to see blood shed. For many people, it makes them physically ill. For most people, there's a sense of empathy with whatever, whomever, has had their blood shed. To us, blood represents death. Now, these are very basic ideas, things that humans respond to at a very fundamental and profound level. Attached to the idea of death and blood is birth and blood. When a female gives birth to a baby, there is blood all over the place. And so in the primitive mind, tied together with the very beginning of a human with the very beginning of a human being is blood so from the human from the very beginnings of human history there's been this tight tying together of humans and blood well the christians and the jews both took the blood and the death 
and tied it together with human sacrifice. And from earliest times, both the Jews and uh, other religions, among them the Aztecs, which, as I mentioned in this book, The Mythic Image, where uh, it demonstrates that the Aztec beliefs came from the Middle, e Middle Eastern beliefs, of which the Jewish religion is typical, um, is this belief that a human must be sacrificed. And one of the stories that ties this up is the story of Abraham and Isaac. Now, maybe there was never an Abraham and maybe there was never an Isaac, but the Jews did, as a matter of fact, sacrifice humans to make up for the sins of the tribe. And this human sacrifice was carried forward into Christianity and, and the clear and major example of that is the sacrifice of Christ. Christ is given, according to Christian theology, as a sacrifice for all of our sins. Well, Christian theology now, 2,000 years later, will tell you that was all a fairy tale. It was not all a fairy tale. As a matter of fact, it was common practice in the Middle East at that time to take a young man and kill him in order to make the rest of the tribe able to survive for the rest of the year. I submit to you that that is a sick and perverted idea, that blood should be shed to make other humans be able to live. And if you read the Roman writings of that time, they call the Jews barbarians and decry this beast, bestial and, uh, and cruel practice of sacrificing humans in order for others, supposedly, uh, to be able to survive. Now, this is a common practice among many primitive, uh, among many primitive cultures to take a young person and cut them up and throw pieces of their bodies around their territory in order to make their territory fertile, even extending so far as to eat, cannibalize this young person to literally take their flesh and consume it in order to take on the strength of this person. And that is the very essence of the Christian communion. Take eat, this is my body, drink, this is my blood. And it's not symbolic, as they would claim, it's real. And it's based on a savage and barbaric practice. So what I would like you to do today, in conclusion, is to rethink what you're told is all symbolic. I would like to encourage you to go to these books that I've suggested, and to follow up in their bibliographies and understand that here today in the 20th century, we continue to believe in and we continue to go with barbaric practices. This is what Free Thought Forum is about, is about rethinking. I would like for you to rethink. This is Don Lawrence asking you to be a free thinker to reconsider even the most controversial of ideas and become a free thinker yourself. Thank you for joining us on Free Thought, for, on free Thought Forum. We'd like for you to join us again. I think as I please, and this gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees, this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to Duke or Dictator. No person can deny, Deacon Duncan Sinfry, no person